Welcome to the Eco Scientist Podcast, where we talk about sustainability and climate science, as well as how it's possible to create a better future for our planet and how you can be a part of that. We're talking about change, standing up for what we believe in, how to communicate science more effectively, career tips, and absolutely everything in between. My name is Amalia Valley, and I am your host. So wherever you are, Get ready for another episode of the Eco Scientist podcast because there's one coming at you right now. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Eco Scientist podcast. Thanks so much for everyone that tuned into the last episode. I loved getting all of your feedback and I would love to hear more. Today's episode is another guest episode and I have with me today Brody Verrill, aka the Alpine Ecologist on Instagram. Hi you guys, thanks for having me on. Before we get into today's episode, I have a special request for those of you that listen on Apple Podcasts. I don't have an iPhone so I didn't know this until recently, but I found out that a lot of the algorithm regarding podcasts relies on people giving ratings. So if someone's interested in topics like this, they won't get a suggestion unless the podcast has ratings similar to those that they listen to. So if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please pause this episode now and go give the Eco Scientist podcast a rating so that you can help me reach more people with this information. So without further ado, let's just jump straight into today's episode with the Alpine Ecologist. So to start off with, could you introduce yourself to my listeners and tell them a little bit about yourself? Sure. So my name's Brody. Um, I'm from the Gold Coast, which is uh, pretty far removed from any mountains or alpine regions. So my undergrad I studied at Griffith University was a Bachelor of Ecology and Conservation Biology. Um, I then moved on to an honours project, a one-year project where I looked at the recovery of alpine vegetation from fires. Um, So the 2003 fires in the Australian Alps were uh, the largest we've had in 60 years. So I looked at uh, long-term monitoring of those, the recovery of those vegetation communities. That's really cool. So for those of my listeners that aren't in Australia, could you explain a little bit about where geographically the Alps are compared to the Gold Coast, Southeast Queensland, where we are right now? Yeah, sure. So the Australian Alps are part of a larger mountain range, uh, the Great Dividing Range, which runs all the way from Melbourne all the way up to uh, the tip of Queensland. So if you drew a line from Sydney to Melbourne, that would be the what we call the Australian Alps. Okay, so how did you become the alpine ecologist specifically? Um, You mentioned that your undergrad was related to conservation biology and ecology, but what was your journey to this particular niche? Because it is a very niche field. Yeah, and uh, I get this a lot, especially coming from the Gold Coast um, and Queensland. We don't really have mountains per se, but I spent a lot of my adult life um, in mountainous regions. So I lived in Canada, Japan, Switzerland, Um, all the time chasing mountains and snow. Uh, So I'm an avid mountaineer. So that kind of paved the way or gave me an introduction to that landscape. And then uh, after years of traveling around the world and mountaineering, I then moved home seeking more and uh, resumed my studies. And um, then one of my professors was actually, I found out she did her PhD in alpine botany pollination. And she worked a lot in the Australian Alps and everything just kind of snowballed from there. That's really cool. I never even considered that alpine ecology or anything to do with snow would be something you could do in Australia. So that's a really cool field to be in. Okay, so before we get into the rest of the topic, because you're the first interviewee in the new studio, you get to be the first victim of my rapid fire round. Are you okay with that? Yeah, let's go. Okay, cool. So basically, I'm just going to ask you some questions and you have to answer with the first thing that comes to mind. (laughs) All right. All right. So firstly, cats or dogs and why? Uh, Dogs, because they don't cause the extinction of as many species. Okay. Lab work or field work? Field work. Field work. That's a good answer. Okay. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when I say the words group assignment? Uh, I'm going to be doing a lot of work. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Tea or coffee? Uh, Tea. Tea. Yep. Um, If you had a time machine, would you travel back in time or forward in time first and why? I would go back in time. Um, I'm really curious about uh, evolutionary biology and Mm -hmm. history um, and even the development of our own species. So to see uh, certain events and times that shaped that would be really cool, I think. That's a really cool answer. Okay, uh, would you rather have three feet or three hands? Three hands. Three hands, okay. Um, What things do you associate with the colour green? 
uh, plants. And lastly, this is really random. Someone asked me this the other day. Mm -hmm. Is it okay for a vegan to eat animal shaped crackers? Yeah, I uh, don't see a problem okay. with that. <laughs> it's, like so it's, it's an odd question. It is an odd question. Yeah. Someone asked you the other day, they're like, can vegans eat animal crackers? I was like, yeah. I, I, well, I, okay, so I buy this pasta from the source Bulk Foods and yeah. it's shaped as African yeah, animals sure. and it's delicious and yeah, it's fun. So. It's fun. There you go. All yeah. right, so there's the answer to your question, random guy from the street. <laughs> vegans can eat animal shaped crackers or animal shaped foods. Okay. So now that we know a little bit more about you, even though trivial, I think those things are mildly important. Yeah, for sure. um, let's talk about the work that you're doing because I think it's really important stuff and I would love to know more and I know my listeners would love to know more as well. Mm -hmm. um, first, I want to ask you some general questions uh, regarding the ecosystems that you primarily work in. So for your PhD, you're working in alpine regions of Australia, which you just mentioned. And in my recent climate science episode, which I'll link in the show notes below for those of you that haven't listened yet, I describe the difference between the natural greenhouse effect and the enhanced greenhouse effect and what we're current, currently experiencing and how that relates to our changing climate. Could you explain how the enhanced greenhouse effect and other elements of climate change are affecting areas with colder climates in general? Mm -hmm. So yeah, a lot of people aren't familiar with the alpine ecosystem. So when we look at the enhanced greenhouse effect or climate change along an elevational gradient, there's actually a pretty um, significant increase with elevation. So the basis is the higher you go, the more warming you're going to experience. So there's been studies that looked at um, warming over the last 20 years above 4,000 metres elevation, and they found it was 75% faster warming than elevations below 2,000 metres. So this is called the elevation dependent warming um, and it's driven by a whole bunch of factors and I'm not a climatologist but I've read and it says it's influxed by uh, changes in water vapour in the atmosphere, um, the, the albedo of the snow is a really big factor and we'll get onto that a bit later. Um, but yeah, so all these complex climatic interactions at this high altitude make the warming there a lot faster. Wow, that's really interesting. Mm. I didn't actually know that. Yeah. That's really cool. So in my last episode, I mentioned briefly that um, ice melting is obviously a huge part of climate change and sea level rise. And, and we see it happening all over the world, especially around the poles during polar summers. Um, but yeah, I didn't realize that those areas were actually at more risk of warming. I thought it was all the same. So Yeah, so cool. high elevations also act pretty similar to the poles. So if you get far enough north or south, it will mm. te technically turn into alpine tundra, which mm. is just alpine is uh, defined by the absence of trees. Um, so basically it's too cold there for the deposition of woody tissues. Mm. Um, so yeah, climate change is affecting the poles, um, but also the high altitude regions and all the, um, the glaciers and the runoff, associated runoffs are a really big impact on climate change that people often overlook. Yeah, that's really cool. So I assume that monitoring this sort of stuff would be pretty difficult, especially long term. Um, but you mentioned to me previously that you have data that's about 15 years old, mm -hmm. which I think is really substantial amount of data to have. Um, for those of you that aren't in ecology, uh, you might not know that it's really hard to keep projects running long term and to create long term data, which is a huge problem we have with climate change monitoring in general. Um, how do you monitor ecosystems like this? And could you tell me how you're monitoring these changes? Yeah, sure. So there's a series of the projects I'm doing um, as part of my PhD, which my supervisor and a couple of her colleagues started about 15 years ago in the Australian Alps um, with the whole... So at the turn of the millennia, uh, there was a huge out, outcry for long-term monitoring in ecology because um, at, the, at the end of the day, it is our most powerful tool to map change through time, especially like a temporal issue like climate change. So these uh, projects were established in the Australian Alps and uh, they've been surveyed uh, two times uh, with about a seven to eight year gap in between. And I'm coming through and doing the third assessment on these projects. That's really, really cool. So it's like a very long term thing. Yeah. yeah. So one of them is part of an international collaboration called Gloria, which is the Global Observation Research Initiative into Alpine Environments. Um, so that's spread across uh, about 80 target regions um, in six continents. Mm -hmm. So that's a really cool project to be a part of. And then we've kind of adapted the methodologies from that project to other to look at other things or mm -hmm. other vegetation communities. 
Yeah, cool. So how is vegetation and soil in these areas related to climate change? Um, and which ones are you monitoring and what exactly about them are you monitoring? Yeah, so I just spoke about the uh, Gloria project, so mm -hmm. I'll start with that. Um, the basis of it is you are um, surveying summit vegetation, so mm -hmm. vegetation on top of mountain summits along an elevation gradient. So we have five summits in Kosciuszko National Park along an elevation gradient, and we basically survey um, the vegetation within the first five meters of the summit and then the next five meters. So the whole idea around this is that as the climate warms, um, these plants are going to be uh, migrating upslope, um, and these summits act as like little terrain traps almost, or islands in the sky. So by, long, by monitoring these over a long period, we might see the shift of species up or the expansion of some species, the loss of some species. So that's the basic premise for that. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, mountain environments are the perfect, <laughs> the perfect place to do these kind of experiments because as you increase throughout the elevation gradient, you get a zonation of ecosystems based on the climate. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then I'm also looking at the vegetation associated with the latest lying snow patches in the Australian Alps. So you have uh, dominant westerly winds throughout the winter, which uh, create these really big uh, deposits of snow on your lee aspects. Um, and they last a uh, couple months into the summer. Like they generally melt out around January to February. Yeah. Um, and obviously then there's only a couple months of growing season available to these plants. So it's a very um, unique and special community of plants there. Yeah. Um, so we set up uh, monitoring across, uh, again, an elevation gradient, but not as big, um, through a snowmelt gradient. So we have plots in the early snowmelt, mid snowmelt, and late snowmelt. Yeah, that's really cool. So you mentioned about the growing season being really short, mm -hmm. um, but obviously if there's less snow and the climate is warming, then the growing season will be longer, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And that's, that's what's going to be driving a lot of the change in these mm -hmm. systems. So what about arthropods in these areas? How are they related to climate change? Yeah, so in the Australian Alps, the Australian Alps are unique. Uh, they're not only just nationally significant, but internationally significant. Um, so the Australian Alpine area evolved without the um, presence of grazing animals or mammals. Mm -hmm. So all we have up there are arthropods or insects to graze. So there's really interesting uh, plant-insect interactions going up there and a lot of really strong associations. Um, so we're using arthropods as a bioindicator of climate change too. So as these vegetation communities shift, we expect to see a kind of mirroring in the arthropods as well. Yeah, that's really cool. So basically they're just replacing species like moose or yeah. antelope that you yeah. might have in areas yeah, like or Canada. Deer or deer or, yeah. yeah, but although there are deer in Australia now and they're, they're becoming now. a problem. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Invasive species are always a problem, especially yes. here. Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, so I just got back from an international mountain conference and it was really interesting to see people's perception of feral species and mm -hmm. impacts in mountain environments. Mm -hmm. And Australia is just like, and New Zealand, I think, mm -hmm. uh, probably one of the two most susceptible countries to invasive species because mm -hmm. of our um, geographical isolation for so long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. There's um, When I went to Galapagos, there was a huge problem with invasive species mm -hmm. there. Um, and they have some of the most amazing programs to deal with invasive species, um, not only just monitoring programs, but programs that are designed to get rid of invasive species. Um, I think we could learn a lot from them, actually. Yeah, which is, I think we could. We definitely <laughs> need to, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so far through this research, through with the data that already existed, as well as the stuff that you have, um, you've done, what are you seeing so far and what's your hypothesis for the future? Uh, so... Basically, what we're seeing is the thermophilization and homogenization of the alpine vegetation. So mm -hmm. thermophilization means the chrilophilic or cold-loving species mm -hmm. are slowly getting out-competed yeah. and disappearing from the community assemblages, and you're just getting more thermal, thermally tolerant species, so more species from lower elevations, mm -hmm. uh, more shrubs um, that are, you know, do well, do better in uh, warmer climates, mm -hmm. um, and grasses especially. So what we're seeing is an influx in grasses and shrubs. The large increase in vegetation cover or vegetation density is been driven by uh, uh, shrubs at higher elevations and 
grasses at lower elevations. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the basis of what we're seeing so far. My hypothesis for the future is, so this incorporates some of my honors research and, um, but basically what we're seeing is all these alpine environments now are having increased fuel loads. So fire is going to be a really important driving factor of change in the Australian Alps, which is a little bit separates it from the rest of the world. Yeah. Um, so yeah, as, as the vegetation becomes denser and as the thermophilization of the vegetation continues and these fuel loads continue to increase, we're going to see a positive feedback where there's more fuel, more fires, so yeah, not, yeah. A, not a great recipe. Yeah, we've, we've already been seeing that a little bit more, especially areas like the Gold Coast hinterland, which has been yeah. up in flames already this year, yeah. um, all throughout O'Reilly's Lamington National Park, mm -hmm. which is really sad. Areas that I hiked only like three weeks or so before the fires, yeah. um, and they're really beautiful ecosystems, and to see them go, yeah. or not, not to go, but hopefully, but to change, to change yeah. so much yeah, as a result of the fires. Um, and we've had a lot of bushfires in Australia this season, and we're technically not in our standard bushfire season yet. That's the worst part. So <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's really scary. These are recent events, and um, we haven't spoken much about uh, precipitation yet, but mm. that's, that's a, obviously a huge thing in Australia. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're a drought-stricken country historically, but... Yeah these pressures are only going to be exacerbated with climate change. Yeah. Um, and as for the rainforest burning, I mean, there's areas there that haven't burnt in 3 million years, and yeah. they did in early September this year. Yeah, so yeah. Well, that's I, alarming. I hiked through Lamington National Forest. Um, we did a, an overnight hike in August, mm -hmm. and when we were hiking through, it didn't rain at all, mm. but it was so wet that we were damp the yep. whole time just walking through the rainforest. And this was only three or four weeks before the fires went through and most of those trails that we walked were completely burnt out mm -hmm. um and when I was walking through I was literally thinking like oh my god this place would never burn down you know because he was starting to talk about fires showing up around the sunny coast especially mm -hmm. we had some fires in Perigian um but it's more temperate forest here whereas yeah. the Gold Coast hinterland like it's so green and lush and yeah. there's so much moisture and I was just so confused mm -hmm. like it's absolutely crazy um and to think that somewhere like that could could burn is um, pretty shocking, to be honest, especially when you consider we have a lot of ecosystems very similar, especially up in tropical North Queensland. And mm. Yeah, it's not a good time. Um, but how do we preserve these ecosystems? Like, what can we actually do? What do they need? Uh, so the, the largest thing you can do for this ecosystem, because it is governed by low temperatures, the, the whole ecosystem functions off. Uh, a reliance on snow cover and mm -hmm. water runoff. Uh, the biggest thing we could do would be to act on climate change, add a you know decouple our society from fossil fuel industry, stop stop emitting. Um, of course, that's not a very easy thing to do. Yeah. Uh, if we're looking at more direct things we can do in these areas, it would be uh, like I said, uh, feral animals mm -hmm. is a huge. It's it's another pressure we're adding to the system that does not need to be there. Yeah. Um, also, after fires come through, um, it would be monitoring and uh, kind of managing the land so invasives don't infiltrate. Um, so mm -hmm. just this will all bolster the resilience of this alpine zone that is under so much pressure from climate change. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I know when it comes to coral reefs, when there's a lot of leaching, they tend to reduce uh, tourist activity to those areas especially mm -hmm. when it comes to divers because there's a huge problem in the reef where um, mostly tourists that are unexperienced divers um, or snorkeling for the first time tend to be less careful and kick mm -hmm. corals and stuff which adds extra pressure like you were yeah. talking about with the feral animals mm -hmm. do you think we could do something regarding tourism or yeah so the australian alps is a huge tourism destination as well same similar to the great barrier reef mm -hmm. so winter tourism alone generates almost two billion dollars per year wow. um you see about almost 2.5 million visitors in the winter so it's heavily based on okay. snow that yeah. the whole tourism sector around that so conserving that snow would be not only smart ecologically but for um sociologically and for the economy as well yeah um, but for the impacts of tourism uh, throughout summer, yes. So we have uh, a fair few walking tracks in the Australian Alps that go through some of the rarest plant communities in Australia, like go straight through them. Yeah. And they've been there for the longest time because they're on a ridgeline. Yeah. Um, and it makes sense to put a trail on a ridgeline, but yeah. that ridgeline is also a really interesting um, 
climatic area, which mm-hmm. then harbors, you know, a, a sweeter species that is found nowhere else. Yeah. Um, so we could move, or they have begun to move some of these trails in the Australian Ops, uh, mm-hmm. started to put in raised metal walkways, yep. um, and a lot of education started going into this region too. Um, about transporting pathogens like Phytophthora, which mm-hmm. is having a massive impact on the dieback of some shrub species in the yeah. Alps. Um, so yeah, I think it's just, we need to take a more integrated approach to management because mm-hmm. that's something we can control. Yeah, um, exactly. You know, uh, yeah, so you got to do what you can and then hope the rest will kind of follow from yeah. that. Yeah, definitely. Um, and speaking of hope, what do you think the best hope for conserving these ecosystems is? You mentioned a few different conservation strategies, but... Mm-hmm. I don't know. Is there anything else? <laughs> uh, yeah, I get asked this a lot. Um, is there hope for this uh, ecosystem in Australia? Um, and because it is such a small uh, area and really susceptible to climate change, yeah, th- it doesn't look great. But yeah, there's still hope. Yeah. Like while we still have choices to, you know, uh, remove feral animals from this ecosystem or give it its best chance of, yeah. um, you know, being a functional ecosystem, then yeah, there's hope. Yeah. Um, as for the rest of the whole climate change story and yeah. um, changing things on a massive, like we would need um, radical revolu- revolution yeah. to change the discourse or yeah. change the direction of where we're going with this. Yeah. Um, but there are things we can do on the ground and that gives me hope. Yeah, that's good. What do you think that people who aren't scientists, who aren't into research, um, or people who maybe aren't old enough to be yet, um, or people who are just interested, what do you think they could do to help the cause in their day-to-day life with climate change in general, not mm-hmm. just the Alps? But yeah. So one of the most powerful things you can do as an individual and in a democracy is write, have, make your voice heard, write emails to your local MPs, show up to rallies, show up to... Um, you know, uh, information nights, shop to development plans, like any, you just need to be, like exercise your right as a citizen and make your voice heard. That's the way we're going to affect change in our society yeah. is if we all are saying the same thing over and over and over again, it will eventually get the ball rolling. Uh, there are other things you can do with your own choices. So mm-hmm. money is another big power we have as citizens. So choosing where you're going to spend your money, who you're going to fund, who you're going to donate to perhaps. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a big thing. Uh, also what you're going to buy. Yeah. So being more conscious of what uh, food you buy. I mean, you eat three times a day. Yeah. You could choose something that's far less carbon intensive. Mm-hmm. Um, also your choices on public transport. Just just trying to make yourself, your carbon footprint as small as possible yeah. is one of the best things you could do. Yeah, definitely. And I, I spoke about a few things in, in one of my episodes recently. Um, but I think there's so much more to cover. Mm. Um, and going back to writing to MPs and stuff, mm-hmm. that's actually so important. Um, and I think a lot of people don't really know how to do that or where to start. So yep. okay. I think I'll post on the blog for you guys by the time this episode is up. Uh, there'll be like a bit of a guide on there on how to write to your MPs, how to contact them, yep. um, and make sure you get heard instead of just being sent to the spam box or yep. whatever. So um, yeah, look out for that one, guys, because it will be up on the blog yeah there is a couple of really good um organizations you can just get on their email chain and they'll send you out pretty much pre-written emails you write in one one paragraph Mm -hmm. of of personal information yeah and it's all automated so the australian uh wildlife conservancy is Mm -hmm. a good one um pow protect our winters is another good one um the greens even are good so if you just put your uh get on their mailing list Mm -hmm. they'll send you out emails and the things you feel passionate about then you can write to Hmm, that's really cool to know we'll link all of those resources in the show notes below and i'll put them on the eco scientist podcast instagram for you guys so you'll be able to find those as soon as you want to so back to your field specifically, mm. um, working in any niche within ecology, conservation or climate science is something that can be pretty daunting at times um, and a bit depressing. But about what you do specifically, could you tell me something that you love about it? What do you love most about it and what makes it all worth it? Uh, yeah, so you've spoken about this previously on some of your podcasts and it's something that's emerging a lot in conservation science is mm-hmm. the mental health of conservationists yeah. um and yeah it, it, it is a very daunting task when you have that much understanding about um a, a certain system and the, the impacts that uh the anthropocene has had on those systems 
But what I love most about my job is I get to go to some pretty remote, wild and um, beautiful landscapes and conduct meaningful research that's part of a, a long-term project. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a legacy aspect to it as well. Um, there's a transfer of knowledge. So I have two supervisors who um, are about 40 years my senior. Um, and it's just amazing to go walking uh, through the landscape with them and they just, they, everything, literally, they do not stop talking to me the whole time. It's just, yeah. oh, this, oh, that, oh, that's, yeah. oh, look at that, oh, that's dying back. Like, yeah. And their knowledge on the landscape is just mind-blowing. So yeah. that's what makes it worth it for me. The, the fact that I can then merge my uh, passions I developed for, um, you know, outdoor recreation and mountaineering I can still do that and um, work towards trying to help these ecosystems that are giving me so much. Yeah. Um, that's what makes it work. It worth yeah, it. that's really cool. That's something that drew me towards ecology as well. Um, was I heard about the fieldwork side of things? A friend of mine yeah. was like, "I'm going on a field trip and we're doing this," and I was like, <laughs> "I do that for fun. How is that yeah, yeah. uni work? Wait, like, I can get paid. To do yeah, that. I can. Yeah. Get, I was like, <laughs> the, and the uni was um, was paying for the whole field trip mm -hmm. as part. Well, it's part of course fees, so you pay for it, but yeah, you know, but your course fees stay the same. So exactly. you sit in a classroom while you're outside. Well yeah, and I was so shocked that it was um it was a thing. Um, and obviously there's sides of ecology or any conservation science where you do have to sit in front of a computer and analyze data for a few days, Yes. sometimes longer, um, yeah. as in my case right a, now. A lot longer. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think I've been looking at data for like three or four weeks straight now, but that's okay because yeah. yeah, when you're out in the field, especially if you're in areas that you love, it's definitely worth it. It makes it all worth it. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. you draw on that for your inspiration, you know, if you're sitting... Mm -hmm staring at a computer for months on end, yep. writing code and statistical analysis can be a little uh, mundane, but uh, you look forward to planning your next trip to the field. And Yeah, yeah. definitely. Especially when you get to go to really cool remote places. Like, mm. I mean, the Australian Alps, especially you mentioned um, all the way down to Melbourne, it costs like thousands of dollars to travel down there to go to Threadbow if you want to yes. snowboard. Yeah. Like it's cheaper to go from, from Brisbane airport, it's cheaper to go to... New Zealand yes it is. and snowboard in <laughs> Queenstown yes. in another country <laughs> yes. than it is to go down to to Threadbro yeah like, I know. it's incredible you know so <laughs> yeah the fact that you can do that as yeah. part of work that's that's really cool not that you snowboard the whole time but like I mean at least you, you're in that bit of the ecosystem. time yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. what do you prefer snowboard or skiing uh I'm a much better snowboarder than I am skier okay do um, you skate or surf a uh, little bit, but yeah. I'd say snowboarding would be my um, okay. primary board sport. Okay, I've been told that if you can skate or surf, you can snowboard. I wouldn't really agree with that. You wouldn't agree no. with that? Okay. I think it helps, but yeah, to say, you, okay, yeah, you can get down a mountain, but I think yeah. if you're a professional, I've seen professional surfers just be terrible okay <laughs> at snowboarding okay so. i have no hope now <laughs> i'm going to new zealand next year i've never okay. done any snow sports before okay and um i think i think that's better you like learn yeah just start with a blank canvas yeah. and yeah don't try and transfer the skills after you've okay. learned yeah because mm. the balance and the those kind of skills yeah they're important but you need yeah. to get, get a foundation on snow first okay and then incorporate i'm them. so scared of face planting yeah, edge edge catches are a real thing. Yeah, so watch out for that. All right, I'll watch out. <laughs> okay, so regarding fieldwork and and everything you mentioned before, mm -hmm. do you have any really cool uplifting stories or amazing experiences that have been related to your career path? Something that wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for your field. Yeah. Uh, so my external supervisor, Dr. Ken Green, um, he was the alpine ecologist at uh, Kosciuszko National Park for the last twenty five years. Wow. Um, so he's just an absolute wealth of knowledge and he loves mountaineering, skiing, backcountry touring, all the things that I enjoy as well. So we get along uh, a lot on that level. Mm -hmm. um, but it was about two years ago, he had a pretty debilitating stroke. Um, so that kind of was a really big turning point in his life where he had to give up his profession. Um, he was severely uh, reduced in his mental capacity. Mm -hmm. He could no longer publish or write for a period. Um, but he's, he's started to really get that back and um, he's since published his first paper since his stroke. Mm -hmm. It's been accepted for publication um, and I, whenever I'm out in the field I always go out with him and he, he really enjoys those experiences too because now um, he doesn't really have anyone to do that with. Yeah. Um, and just recently I was down there and we did his first snow camping since his stroke, so almost two years mm -hmm. after and he, w he was a man who'd spend 
you know, 50, 50 nights of winter snow camping. So yeah. um, I think that was a really rewarding experience. Wow, that's really cool. Mm. That's so cool. Um, it seems like that's happened to quite a few conservationists when they have some sort of injury or something that prevents them from doing their work and getting back into it is mm. such a huge thing. Um, I think I spoke about in one of my previous episodes um, a book called The Great Barrier Reef, and I'll link the Amazon link in the show notes below. Um, and the guy who wrote the book, he was not a scientist, and he just started joining expeditions out to the reef because he wanted to learn more and write a mm. book about it. And about three quarters of the way through his trip and all of his um, expeditions and stuff he fell off his roof at his house um, and got uh, like a brain injury um, as well as a lot of physical injuries Um, and he couldn't scuba dive anymore and he couldn't do all of these things and then the whole direction of like the book and everything that he was learning like the whole perspective completely changed and then he spoke about like getting back into it and the the newfound respect he had for those ecosystems Mm -hmm. seems like a really cool I don't know twist to put on something bad that's happened so yeah yeah, it's cool that you got to be a part of that for someone else yeah yeah Yeah. so you mentioned snow camping yes now i do not do well in the cold um (laughs) and i've been i've been camping in winter quite a few times um but have absolutely froze my butt off Mm -hmm. how do you not freeze when you're snow camping uh gear Good gear. Good gear. You need to spend a See, lot of money on it. I thought my your... gear was good mm. gear, but it's not, apparently. Apparently not, Apparently yeah. not, no. No, there's... Yeah, I mean, there's a point where it's that cold, you can't get warm, but that's... I mean, even with the highest quality gear, that's about minus 40. So yeah. you can get gear that's going to keep you comfortable up to about those temperatures. Okay. Um, but it's just what you're willing to pay for that comfort. Wow. Um, but there's a couple of tricks you, you learn... Um, to keep yourself warm mm-hmm. um you know boiling water and having a little hot water bottle yeah. for your feet is a really uh, a smart thing to do um but also uh, just the way you camp is a really big factor mm, definitely. um yeah how you're going to set up your snow cave or anything like that um it's always better to have more people in one tent and mm-hmm. then have a gear tent like a tent for your gear oh yeah that's a good um, idea to keep your body warm yeah, yeah but... it's a really good idea mm-hmm. so what is okay two more gear questions what is your favorite piece of gear and what is your most important piece of gear oh okay for snow camping specifically. for snow camping specifically yeah okay yeah my most important piece of gear would be my sleeping bag yeah um so if you have a good enough sleeping bag you don't need a tent Okay. Um, <laughs> that kind of scares me. Yeah, yeah, it's a little scary. I have but... like a weird fear of bugs crawling in my ear. <laughs> <laughs> well, on snow camp, you don't need to worry about bugs. You said there's bugs up there. Yes, in the spring. In the spring, so right, okay. We're, so I was just down there in October and we saw the first insects start to emerge. Okay, all so right, so you're yeah. generally pretty safe. All right. Yeah. And there's no bears here, which is, which no is what we spoke about yeah. before. So, yeah. okay, it's actually probably safer up there than yeah. it is down here. It is. I'd there you say. go. Apart um, from the cold. And then my favorite piece of gear for snow camping would probably be my tent your tent okay it's just yeah it's always fun you know making a nice platform for it setting it up and then finally laying down after a long long day yeah yeah and it would involve a lot of hiking and physical fitness as well so yeah 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 it's really cool you get to maintain your fitness through work and do something you love Mm -hmm. i'm mildly jealous (laughs) (laughs) you mentioned before about precipitation Yes. Um, and how Australia is a drought-stricken country, which a lot of people are aware of. Yes. Um, how does that affect alpine environments? Okay, so snow is, although we have very little snow and it's extremely fickle and unpredictable in Australia, it's actually really, really important, not only for the alpine ecosystem, but for all the downslope ecosystems as well. Mm-hmm. So we've seen about a 30% reduction in snow cover over the last 50 to 60 years. Um, and this snow cover or like snow melt in the spring and summer is really important for charging a lot of our major river systems. Um, so the Australian Alps is the headwaters for the Snowy River, uh, the Murrumbidgee and the Murray River. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're all familiar with the murray Darling Basin yeah. um, catastrophe that's kind of going on at the moment. Uh, so yeah, this, these precipitation events and snow accumulation um, is on the decline. Um, this is going to have trickle-on effects for every ecosystem downslope. So water from the Australian Alps, there's about 9,600 gigalitres. So that's about Jesus 20 Christ. Sydney harbours. Wow. So a lot of water. And so changes 
in the scenario regimes predicted under uh, the future climate change scenarios are likely to have significant ap- uh, impact on the biota whose ecology is intrinsically linked to these snow conditions. Mm-hmm. Um, not only the ecology, but then you also have the socioeconomic economic impacts as well uh, with the tourism aspect. Yeah. Um, also, hydroelectricity is a huge thing. We have Snowy and Snowy 2.0 about yeah. to start. So if we're looking at transitioning to renewables, we're really dependent on that precipitation. But yeah, so what we're seeing, and especially this winter, we're seeing is a lot of warming over the Antarctic or the West Antarctic, sorry, the West Antarctic shelf. Mm -hmm. Um, So the way snow makes it to Australia is actually a really complex interaction. I'll give you a quick overview here. So you have basically three weather systems that uh, work together in a certain combination and then you'll get snow. Um, But with this warming over Antarctica, uh, you're getting a negative southern annular mode, which Mm -hmm. actually tracks low pressure systems further south off the coast. So these precipitation systems aren't even hitting Australia anymore. So with increased warming in the stratosphere, which is uh, predicted through climate change, less and less of these low pressure systems throughout Mm -hmm. the winter are going to be hitting Australia. So it's not just the Alps that are going to be threatened by this, the whole southern half of Australia. Yeah, yeah. And I'm assuming that this would affect uh, a lot of other countries that's probably in the southern hemisphere as well. Not there's many of them, but yes. we've got, you know, South America, the, yes. the tip of that is in the southern hemisphere. Yeah. So. yeah, I'm not too sure on the climatology around what causes precipitation events around there, but mm-hmm. I know New Zealand's pretty similar. Yeah. Um, but with a negative southern annular mode, it means they'll probably get more precipitation okay, because cool. the systems won't hit us, they'll track lower they'll and track hit them. They'll track lower and hit them, yeah. yeah. So people in different countries might actually see different things. Yes, yeah. yeah. It's a, climate change is not just one outcome. It's exactly. a very localised thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, in the climate change scenario, uh, somewhere 200 kilometres down the road may be much better off than where you Uh, you are currently yeah yeah I think that's actually really important to highlight because I've had a lot of people make comments like oh climate change isn't real because we just had the coldest winter in my town or Mm. climate change isn't real because you're saying you got a drought but it just rained here so you must be lying you know yeah Um, climate change uh, the best way I've dealt with that kind of thing is like climate change exacerbates anomalies so mm -hmm. these rare events or these weird events that we may have seen you know historically X number of years they're yeah. happening at two times that rate or three yeah. times that rate or three times the intensity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, mm. so it's not just global warming. There's also colder winters maybe happening in yes. some areas. Yes. Hotter summers, of course, but Definitely. also, like we mentioned before, more frequent natural disasters like mm. fires, uh, cyclones, especially in North Queensland yep. and most places along the equator. Um, so, yeah, I think that's really important to remember. And for those of you that have contacted me previously about getting into debates and conversations being like someone just said that climate change isn't real because it's cold where they are um and it's getting colder you know i've literally had people make those comments to me as well so i completely understand um yeah definitely remember that just like Brody said it exacerbates natural anomalies it's not about getting hotter or getting colder Mm. um it's about a change in the system just like i mentioned in the last episode so Mm. i think that's definitely a good point to draw on when you're having these conversations especially with people in power um, politicians people that might be making decisions um, to help them understand what's going on so Mm -hmm. yeah really good point so with that i think we will end the episode here unless you have anything else you want to add no, I think that pretty much wraps it up. I think that pretty up. much wraps it up. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you guys so much for tuning in. The Instagram accounts for both myself and Brody will be linked in the show notes below. Um, I'll be linking the podcast Instagram page, which is a new one, not my personal one anymore. Um, and Brody is at alpine.ecologist on Instagram. So be sure to follow him. He's got some really cool photos of lots of different like plants that are in alpine environments. Lots of them that I didn't know grew up there and some like super pretty flowers and stuff as yeah. well. Yeah, alpine's really pretty for yeah. flowers. So. Yeah, it's really pretty. So mm. if you guys want to see some really beautiful photos from alpine environments, definitely follow Brody. He's also got some super cool info on his Instagram as well. Um, I'll be linking all the resources that we mentioned earlier in the episode in the show notes below, as well as all my mental health resources, um, the Patreon page, pretty much everything you need to take you on from here. And I will talk to you guys in the next episode. Thanks so much for coming in today, Brody. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, you're totally welcome. See you guys. Bye. That was episode nine of the Eco Scientist podcast with Brody Verrill, also known as the Alpine Ecologist on Instagram. 
I am your host, Amalia Valley, wishing you a great day or a great night wherever you are.